Yeah, and I guess this will be very naive step by step because uh, I I'm fairly I'm fairly new to to sadly to kind of the pull request. I, I use GitHub a fair bit, but only just for my my own work where I'm the only contributor uh, and I'm the one who's managing the repo. So this is kind of a little new to me. Um, so let me share my screen and I'll walk everyone through, I guess, uh, how to do this in case it's in case it's useful and maybe those more familiar with this process can can stop me along the way and give me some tips, pointers, or tell me what I'm doing wrong. Um, so here I'm just connecting to uh, Slack. This is our uh, the Slack channel for, for this book club. Um, so kind of step number one um, is find the find our repo. So uh, at the very top of the Slack UI, this is actually new to me too, that you get these pinned elements. Um, uh, you can find the GitHub repo. repo. Um, the one you want is a new one. Um, just click on that. You'll be taken to our GitHub uh, repo, uh, where basically a template exists for for our notes, uh, and then for those uh, chapters that have been covered already, the notes that we've we've contributed to the to, to the overall book notes. Um, how to move from this to making a contribution? Um, well, thankfully, the steps uh, have been traced very nicely by by John uh, in the README file. So if you scroll down the repo to the uh, how to present section. Uh, you'll find kind of a step-by-step -step process for, for doing so. So the first little block is, you know, kind of setting it up so that you can uh, connect your RStudio to, um, to to your installation of Git uh, and your GitHub account. I won't go over that. And then the second bit is uh, how how you can kind of make a, a, post, a, a pull request. Um, right. So... Uh, and it basically gives you a step of uh, a set of uh, use this steps. Uh, for doing this. So kind of first first step, uh, which is kind of in the previous set is make a clone um, uh, or rather make a, you know, fork, um, fork the repo. Um, and then you're gonna do a pull request. So I'll just take this and you can give it some, some arbitrary name. Uh, let me just toggle to my RStudio. So let me make the font a little bigger here. Um, actually I'll make, I'll make a, a real, uh, pull request, uh, I'll, add, I'll add a license uh, to our, our repo. Um, oops, sorry, I've already made my first mistake. Uh, I should be operating within the context of this project. So um, book club for advanced star. So now our studio is loading up my um, book club for advanced R uh, project. And now that I'm in this context, I'll do my first uh, pull request. Uh, license. Here you can kind of see, um, you know, what's, what's, what's going on. Um, So use this as a behind the scenes, uh, creating a branch with this name um, in, my, in my fork of the repo. So I'm not sure why this is taking so long. Maybe I'll just narrate the other steps while my, my RStudio catches up. Ah, here we are. Um, Okay, so it's checking to see if there are any changes upstream. Um, so that is to say, in, in the in the main in the main repository, um, and then kind of pulling them pulling them down to my local copy, applying those if needed, and creating creating my branch. So you can see up here in the Git pane. Sorry about the uh, overlay here. Um, I'm in the add add license branch. So there are a few branches of my 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 repo. And I'm in the add license branch. Um, so actually, I'm going to add a license. Apologies for the slowness here. I am accustomed to working in Visual Studio Code, so um, you have to bear with me. I'm I'm just going to take the license from the book itself, uh, copy the content which is in Markdown, and create a Markdown file.
perfect. Let's see if it has. Uh, license.md. Okay. So now I've made I've made some changes. Uh, next step is um, right. So this this is relevant if you're if you're making some changes that where you need to use other other packages. Have a look at this. For me, it, uh, I'll, I'll jump past that. Um, then then build the book just to make sure more is nothing more than kind of a sanity check to make sure that the book the book builds um, correctly as, after you've uh, after you've made the changes. This will take a little while as my local uh, computer and local copy get built into the book. There won't be any real changes in terms of the output, uh, but now there will be a, a license file, which should be down here if I store it in the right place. Ah, there's the license, yeah. Okay, so it's preparing the output. While it's preparing the output, let me then move to the next stage. So the next step is, so I've made a, a local change, but I've not yet committed it to Git. Um, so then uh, I want to go ahead and commit uh, the, the changes. All right, so now it looks like it's building all of the, um, all the HTML files from corresponding to the markdown file chapters. Wait till this is done, but um, in this in the UI, I'll just kind of go to the Git pane and, and, and commit my changes. It's probably okay to do so now, even while things are going on here. Okay, maybe it's preventing me from committing. Warning, okay, good. Got an output. Don't really care about the output. Go to the Git pane, and I'll I'll make my I'll make my commit. Um, apologies again. Um, this seems a little amateurish. I'm usually working with uh, with uh, with the GitHub client. I'm not so familiar with our Studio client. Uh, Let's make a commit message adding same license as advanced book. I'll make a commit. So basically, this is making a commit to my fork of the re to to my fork of the repo on this this um, feature branch. Uh, perfect. And I'm up to date. Next step is then to use the use this to push to push the uh, push the pull request um, to the uh, to the main repo. So not my fork of it, but to the main repo. And then um, basically, John will get notified that there is uh, that there's a pull request uh, for his attention, and then he'll kind of look through, make sure everything's acceptable, uh, and then either merge it or not. Um, so I'll just do. Uh, Use that command to push, push my PR. Apologies, my computer looks to be a little slow. It hasn't had its afternoon coffee. Okay. Let me just go back to the repo and refresh it. Ah, so I think because I had the web page open already. Um, yeah, norm normally if I didn't have the web page open, our studio would open in the browser a pane asking um, if you want to uh, basically apply your pull request. Um, you can add additional information um, if you like, and then create the pull request. And then here you can see this is the not my fork, but the uh, the original repo. Now there's there's a there's a pull request um, from from me uh, waiting waiting to be merged. And so if John is is fine with with that, then he'll he'll merge it in. 
Um, I don't know if that's helpful, uh, Federica. Uh, I don't know if there are any questions or. Thank you. Okay, so now uh, it. So you do you need to cancel your branch now, or you just the, the next time you need to uh, push something? Yeah, thanks. That's that's a great question. So um, here, I guess I'll kind of say what I've done within our studio, and um, uh, the, I, I kind of have some of these questions my, 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 myself on, on kind of how this works. But you know, in the advice on the um, uh, on, on the repo itself, uh, you know, for the next step is um, kind of the well implicitly to hold off until there may be changes that uh, that John or others will uh, either make or request that you make. Uh, so right now there's kind of an active pull request, you know, additional commits could be made to that pull request. But once the pull request has been merged, uh, then, then you have uh, the step, and this is what you're asking about Federica, is uh, 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 use this command to use this PR finish. And so it closes out my, my branch and then, then, then prepares the, the repo for, for making a future commit. Um, I, I was actually reading up on this briefly before our call, but I think what's also being done in this function is um, kind of uh, closing the branch and then maybe also re rebasing, kind of like uh, rebasing your, your, your fork uh, of the, um, your, your fork of the, um, uh, of the, re of the repo so that it's, it's up to, up to date uh, with, you know, like the head of, of, of the main, of the main branch. Uh, on the original on the original repo, and I think Thank that you. also I think also at the stage of the PR init I think the same thing happens as well. But it doesn't look like there's an additional step you need to take at least so far as I know to sort of um, apply like as an additional step to apply changes that have maybe happened since you've last touched the repo. But for those interested, and I'm, I'm definitely one of those people, uh, the use this page actually has, so if you go to the use this uh, package documentation, there's an article on, uh, on pull request helpers is what they call it, that gives a, a little bit more detail on how all of this, and how all of this works and what the functions do, you know, beyond what their, their, their names may suggest. All right. Any, anything else, any other questions or things people wanted to add or maybe hopefully more familiar with this than I? All right, um, if not, I'll, I'll just dive into uh, today's chapter. Um, I, I guess I have to say before before starting, this was, this was actually it turned out to be a lot more fun than it should have been um, because uh, I have to say that you know I've been I've been an R user, but kind of just using the things that exist and taking for granted that uh, that you know there are these things called S3 classes, uh, you know their date times, their their dates, etc. But not really fully understanding where they came from uh, and how they're created. So this chapter was really a lot of fun in that it kind of permitted me to pop the hood, so to speak, uh, uh, um, and 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 really better understand some of the internals of what's, of what's going on. Um, so with that in mind, um, learning objectives, uh, really just, uh, you know, um, last time, you know, last session we learned about kind of names and values. Here we're going to kind of talk about vectors. And vectors, I think it's worth understanding, is much broader than just what you might uh, kind of naively understand as a, like an atomic vector. It's a bigger, bigger class, uh, bigger set of things. And then learn how those things relate to one another. So I'll be coming back. I, I've used throughout the notes. Um, I, I pulled in a lot of the images from, from Hadley's book because I found them really quite useful in setting things up. Uh, and I, I view them as sort of a family tree for vectors. Um, so let's let's imagine that you know you have this thing called vectors, uh, and that there are lots of branches to the vector family, right? So you have atomic vectors, those things that we normally kind of designate as vectors, where all of the elements are of the same type, you know, character vectors, logical vectors, et cetera. Lists, which interestingly turn out to be part of the vector family, their own, their, their own branch. Uh, and then, then maybe let's say a, a close cousin uh, that Hadley included here is, is null. 
uh, which isn't formally a vector, but you know, is kind of useful to talk about in the same context as, as these other as these other objects. Now, this this tree you'll see like as we go from section to section is going to grow more and more branches as as we learn more and more about vectors. Right. Um, good. So first, let's look at atomic vectors. Um, so here we're back again to what I'm calling the family tree, and here you can see, you know, we're going to go through the vector branch of the, uh, uh, the sorry, the, um, the atomic vector branch of the family tree. So remember, in the family tree, we've got here vectors, atomic vectors, and then lists. So we're going to go down the, the down the family tree to atomic vectors, of which there are several types. Um, so you know, you have the ones the ones with which you're hopefully very familiar logical vectors, integer vectors, double vectors, character vectors. These are, there are a few others as well, but Hadley, you know, for simplicity uh, uh, um, uh, of exposition, um, you know, he, he excludes. Uh, but these are, let's say the, the all of, all, all of the, all of the uh, atomic vectors that, that exist. And vectors can kind of be of, of uh, you know, different lengths, right? So you can have a vector that's, that's length one, it's kind of akin to a scalar. Formally, scalars don't exist in R, at least from what I understand. But you can still have a have a vector that has that contains a single a single uh, element, right? Uh, for example, logical vectors where you know you can represent them as you know, true, uh, writing out the word, or just a T, false, or just an F. Uh, doubles that can be expressed in in, in different ways. Uh, so you have a you know, um, or I'm sorry. Uh, this should be, uh, yeah, sorry, don't, yeah, doubles. Uh, doubles, uh, uh, so you can have, you know, one, 1 1.23, you can express them in scientific notation and even in hexadecimal uh, format. Um, you can also have another type of numerical vector, so an integer vector. Um, the difference here is you kind of want to have to kind of postpend an L um, to, to the end of your, your number, just so that, R understands that you're intending this value to be kind of cast to, to the double type, right? So this is a double that's that's one, right? Uh, one point, uh, uh, or, or say integers. Um, um, strings, um, strings here, you, you can capture lots of things. You can capture them with double quotes, as I have here with hello, with single quotes, again, hello. Uh, they can contain Unicode strings. So this is uh, um, hello in Arabic. Um, they can also contain kind of special special characters. So this is the the uh, uh, Unicode. Uh, uh, this is the Unicode code for the sweaty smiley uh, emoji. Um, vectors can be you know length one, but they can also be longer. Um, and there's several ways to make them longer. Uh, one is you know with uh, uh, just by adding additional elements. So here we can have uh, you know with the combined function C. Uh, you know, true, comma, false, and then now I have a length two vector, length two logical vector. You can also combine uh, 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 not just uh, individual elements, but you can combine vectors with vectors to make uh, a vector that contains all of them. So here you can see I've got one vector, which is uh, 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 one and two, another vector three and four, and then I'm combining both of these to end up with the following vector, one, two, three, four, right? Um, uh, a little bit of an aside, I guess I was doing the, uh, looking through the book. I, I went down a little bit of a rabbit hole um, and, and found out that uh, you know th these are all ways in which you can kind of compose vectors, um, you know, make them make them longer, uh, compose vectors and make them longer with base R uh, up to this point. Uh, it turns out Rlang, um, which is uh, an R package, also has kind of vector constructor uh, functions, um, and you know what, what's kind of interesting about them is they are uh, unlike um, uh, you know, the combined function, uh, which just kind of coerces everything to a, to a type. We'll come back to coercion in, in a moment. Uh, here you can explicitly declare the type of, of what's in the vector. So you can say, you know, I'll, I'll have a, a logical and then you can uh, include these things and you know that this is gonna get resolved to a logical vector. There aren't any, any surprises. Um, there are other things that it that it that it does uh, more than just kind of see um, you know, again it enforces types. You can you include a list. You can splice the elements of a list, which may or may not be useful. Also, seems like it, it it points to other types that don't seem to exist in base so far as I know, like bytes. And I'm actually not sure what CPL is. I, I didn't have time to look. Um, uh, right. Then um, you know, with vectors, you can also have 
contain missing values within vectors, but be careful about the inclusion of, of missing values because they're sort of contagious, as Hadley puts it. So, um, you know, oftentimes when you do operations over a set of, of values, uh, you know, a set of elements that include, um, you know, one or more uh, uh, NA, then, then those NAs can kind of uh, um, infect the rest of what you're doing. So if you multiply five times NA, the result is, is NA. Uh, if you kind of sum over a, a vector uh, that includes NA, then the result is, is also NA. But there are some ways, uh, you know, with which you're probably familiar to kind of inoculate yourself against the, the sickness of, of, of NAs. So if you're wanting to do a mathematical operation like this, uh, like you saw before, you can just say for this operation, exclude, uh, you know, remove uh, NAs from, from the operation such that the result is what you expect, one plus two plus three. Um, now, NA is here, so far we've just seen an NA that's kind of a, a basic NA, but there actually are other types of NAs uh, that exist. Um, you know, Hadley kind of, uh, in the book, went over them rather quickly, um, saying that most users wouldn't have to use them, but I think there are, uh, at least in my experience, there are contexts where uh, you have to know about this, uh, uh, where, where, where the type, uh, where, where type matters. Um, so, you know, you can have a logical value that's an NA, uh, integer has its own NA, double, you can see basically the, the, the ideas, uh, with the exception of logical, which is just NA, the, so there, the logical's flavor of NA, for each kind of type that exists, um, there's, uh, you just kind of uh, post pen underscore and then the name of the type, uh, and then you end up with an NA that's of the type, uh, uh, of that type expected. Um, some places where this matters, I know things have changed, but I know I have definitely spent more time than I wanted uh, with, with the dipliers, if else, uh, which, which is really strict about types. Um, so if you're saying, um, you know, if, if there's an N, you know, if there's an N, if, um, if some condition is true, then replace it with an NA, otherwise replace it uh, with, with uh, a double, uh, dplyr, if else, will, will, will protest and say, well, you know, the NA is not of, of, of type uh, type double, for example. So you need to make sure that the types are, are right. Um, on then to kind of testing about uh, vectors. So these are kind of some of the common themes that you'll, you'll see in the chapter, uh, the kind of walk through of you know, the types of things and, and looking at them and then uh, looking at testing, coercion, et cetera. Uh, for, for, for testing, you, know, you may be wondering uh, if you have some vector that exists, you may be in your global environment, you may wonder what type of vector is it? Um, well, uh, the good news is there are ways to test for, for a vector's type. Uh, you have these base R functions, you know, is logical, uh, is integer, is double, is character, which will enable you to determine whether, uh, you know, any given, um, any given um, uh, vector is, is, is of the type you expect. Um, uh, this may be important if you're, you know, kind of processing user inputs or, or, or you have some, some function downstream that expects a vector of a particular type. Um, you can check that it's of the right type before passing it on to to, to, to some other operation. Um, so that's testing the type, but you may also want to make sure that like a vector is, 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 is the type of uh, something that you think of, uh, is a vector is actually what you, you think it is. Uh, and Hadley points out in the book that there are a few functions in base R whose names would lead you to believe that they would, they would test this, but actually they don't, uh, or at least not quite. Uh, and Hadley points, you know, interested, uh, readers to uh, kind of look carefully at the documentation. You know, is vector doesn't quite determine whether something is a vector. Is atomic doesn't quite determine whether the vector is an atomic vector. So a vector with, you know, only the same types of elements in it. Uh, but um, happily, um, Arlang comes to the rescue. Uh, so they have a few, a few functions that I found that, that actually do the thing that base R doesn't. Um, so you have a, a, an is vector function, an is atomic function that uh, yield the results that you would, you would hope. So if I have a vector of uh, kind of one, two, um, and um, uh, you know, I wanna see is, is this thing actually a vector? I can test whether it's a vector and it turns out of course that it is. Uh, also I can check whether a list is a, a, is a vector 
uh, and, and it is. Now remember the, the family tree, so the, the vector, a list is kind of a, a type of vector, uh, as we'll come to see. You can check whether the, the vector in question is atomic, so if I just had this, it's atomic, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, just got the same types of uh, elements in it, so it returns true. Um, and you know, if I try to uh, see if something is atomic, I can create a I can create a list that has um, elements um, that are of different types. So here, numeric, here character. So obviously, this is this is false. If you want to learn, learn a little bit more about this, there's a, a link here to uh, kind of the Arlang documentation uh, around these these types of functions. Um, all right, so we've we've covered kind of the types of vectors that exist. Um, we've covered kind of uh, um, how to uh, how to kind of compose vectors, um, either you know various lengths, length one, a length greater than one. Uh, uh, do some testing. Uh, the other topic uh, that comes is kind of is, is coercion. So uh, coercion is basically uh, uh, is when you have a, 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 a vector of a certain type that um, gets transformed into another type. Um, and there are kind of two two ways that. That, that this can happen. So either it can be done automatically um, uh, through other functions, or it can be done so explicitly. Let's first look at the automatic, then we'll come to the explicit. So for the automatic uh, uh, coercion, um, there, there are two things, uh, kind of two types of operations in, 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 in base R that, that could coerce, uh, uh, that could coerce a um, uh, a, a vector uh, into certain types. There are certain rules I won't go over here, but um, uh, there are certain rules about how things are, are, are coerced, uh, at least for the, these kind of mainstream atomic vectors. Uh, so let's say if I try to compose a vector uh, where I have true, so this is a logical, and then a, 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 um, a character that happens also to contain the word true, but isn't actually the logical, like the Boolean value true, if if I if I uh, if I combine these two with the C operation, um, uh, then then you can see that the result. So I'm just looking at the structure of the result uh, is character. So this boolean value gets coerced into a character value. So there are a few rules about how this works, and this is done automatically with uh, uh, just following R's own internal rules. Uh, once this kind of the C function is invoked, R has its own set of rules about how to how it coerces things into, into different different types. If, if there's, uh, as is the case here, kind of a mismatch of types within what should otherwise be a, a, an atomic vector. Uh, another place where automatic coercion happens is in mathematical operations. Um, this is one, uh, one case that I've, I've definitely used to my benefit many times. Um, so let's imagine you have some logical vector, maybe you can think it's, it's a, a column in a, in, in a, in a data frame um, that kind of uh, captures um, in, in logical terms about whether an attribute exists or doesn't exist for a certain observation. So uh, has the attribute, doesn't have the attribute, et cetera. Um, well, it turns out you can, you can sum over this, uh, the elements of this uh, logical vector, right? So this is a logical vector and you get a number, right? You get a numerical result. What happens is that uh, R performs its automatic coercion at the time of kind of invoking this, this, this sum function. And it, it, it kind of coerces Boolean values into um, their numerical equivalents. So a true becomes a one, a false becomes a zero. So then we have one, two, three trues. If you sum that up, it's, it's three. So you can see where this result comes from. This is automatic conversion, uh, which, which happens in certain contexts, again, with, with, with the uh, combined function and then with mathematical operations. There are also ways that you can explicitly coerce, uh, although I guess maybe this is maybe more casting or recasting. Um, uh, you, this is family of functions of as, fill in the blank, right? So as logical, uh, you know, maybe you could take a, a, an integer vector of ones and zeros and then, uh, and then kind of recast them or kind of coerce them into Boolean values of true and false. Uh, and you can imagine what the the, the rest the rest will do, um, but as you might as you might imagine, coercion, whether it's it's explicit or, or implicit or, uh, or, or automatic or explicit, you know may may fail, right? Uh, and, and and it fail it can fail in a few ways here. Uh, sorry, I don't know if you can see this bar blocking you. I'll move it out of my way. Um, it, but 
you you have uh, you know let's it, it can fail in a few ways just with a warning or and or an error um, like a hard error that would stop execution or it can just generate NAs in in, a, uh, in place of values that couldn't be coerced. Uh, so imagine here you've got this this vector uh, or this effort to make a vector of you know one two which are numerical values and then the word three written out. Um, so then there's no rule that converts uh, this character into an integer value, which is the what I, I'm looking for, integer value. And so in place of three, um, I get an NA. Okay, good. Um, next, next topic. Uh, so we've talked about types of vectors. We've talked about, uh, we've looked at a few uh, atomic vectors, the types of atomic vectors. Now let's look about, uh, look at attributes. So this is kind of a first introduction to attributes, data attributes, um, that's going to set up some of uh, the sections that will come on, on S3 atomic vectors and, and uh, other things, uh, data frames. Um, so basically for attributes, you can kind of think, this isn't the way Hadley sets it up exactly, but I found it useful to think of it as, you know, what are attributes? How do they work and why would you want them? Um, so I'll try to go over those topics. Uh, uh, so first, you know, what, what, what is, what is, uh, what are attributes? Um, I'm not gonna offer like a short answer, but you know, you can think of them kind of in two ways. So one way is they're kind of a set of name value pairs. So basically as you'll, as we'll see in very shortly, um, if you're gonna add uh, an attribute to an object, the attribute needs to have a name and then needs to have a value. Remember this names and values concept. Uh, so it's a name name value pair. Uh, also, the uh, uh, attributes are, are, are basically metadata. So they're not data itself, but instead it's kind of data about the data. Uh, and Hadley warns in the book that you should think of uh, of attributes in often cases as being ephemeral. So certain operations will destroy attributes, um, uh, kind of remove them from 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 the data. Um, how would you go about set, how would you kind of go about setting attributes or getting attributes? The two operations you can think about. Um, so I'll, I'll show first kind of the, 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 the case of how you would add a single attribute and then how you add multiple attributes. It turns out there are different functions for each thing, but the idea is the same, that we're taking an object that exists adding attributes to it, and then looking, looking at the attributes that we've added. Um, so let's, let's imagine that we have this, this, this object here. It's, it's you know, a numeric vector, it could be any arbitrary object. I'll call it A, one, two, three. Uh, I'll, I'll set some arbitrary uh, attribute uh, with the ATTR function. So this is to set a single attribute, uh, you, would, you would use this. Uh, so the, uh, I wanna say the thing, the, the thing that I'm, attaching the attribute to, uh, and then I'm giving them, I uh, have a name of the attribute. Here, I've just written something that's syntactically correct, you know, some attribute name, it could be whatever you want. Uh, and, and then I'm assigning it with the assignment operator some, some value. So here, just some string value. This isn't a very meaningful example, but hopefully it conveys the idea that I'm just adding an attribute to my object and giving that uh, attribute a name and giving that thing, that attribute a value. And then to get the to get the attribute that I've just set, um, it's as simple as using the same function. So in, in, in the case of a single attribute, uh, it, it is just to you know use attr function the the um, uh, look at the, um, the object of interest uh, and then then give the name of the attribute who, whose value I want to see I want to have returned because uh, there may be multiple attributes for the object. And so here you can see I can get some attribute back, which is exactly the, the value um, uh, that I gave to this, this attribute, right? So this is the single attribute case. Excuse uh, me. Sure. Hi, uh, excuse me. So I can uh, like put this attribute function inside a function. So it can release some uh, extra output. Um, like, can I, like if I build a function sure. and, and uh, inside this function, I put this uh, attribute function. When uh, my function release the output, 
it will release as well the output from the attributes function that I've just assigned. So, so I can I, see an extra information. I, I think the answer is yes, Federica. I, I, I assume the answer is yes. Um, I, I didn't look into the source code, but I was kind of curious about this, about how the functions like uh, that actually create um, some S3, S3 vectors, um, how, how they do this under the hood, but I imagine that they must use base R or some extraction of base R. I mean, think about like a, a Luber date, uh, for example, this, this package for dealing with, with, uh, with, with the dates and times and date times. Um, I, I imagine that they must do this under the hood. I, I think the answer is almost certainly yes, although in full transparency, I've not, I've not tried this. Um, but I imagine it must it must be true because basically, you know, if you had a function that's taking some input, like let's say an object that already exists in your global environment, in the function you're doing this, you're adding some attribute, some arbit arbitrary attribute to the object, and then you return that object back to the global environment. I think it should have then, uh, you know, this new attribute about it. I guess in short, I, I assume yes, but. Maybe I'll take his homework to make sure or and or look at some of the source code of, of, of some of the packages that I know create some S3 atomic vectors. Does that help, Federica? Uh, yes. Yes, thanks. OK. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, uh, and, and so now let's kind of move to the multiple attribute case. So there are different functions, but the idea is very much the same. Again, let's have some arbitrary object. Again, I'm just making a numerical vector for simplicity. Uh, there's a function called structure, which allows you to kind of specify the object that you're, to which you're going to um, add attributes. And then, then I guess the kind of dots that follow are these, these series of um, names uh, and values. So on the left-hand side, this is the name attrib one, and then this is the value of attrib one, so uh, one. Uh, these these values and in, in my cases I'm just using strings, but they could be I, th I think they could be other things as well. I think they could be char character vectors, for example, or other other objects. Here, for simplicity, I'm just you know having a, having a name and then some character character value that I'm assigning to that attribute. So here I can set at the, in, in one go I can set attrib one and attrib two for for the object B, and then if I want to get the attribute. Um, then there, there are, uh, the way to do it is, you know, at attributes. So whereas here it's ATTR to get a single attribute, a single attribute of a particular name. Here, if you want to return the, uh, all of the, the list of all the attributes, um, then, then you just use the uh, attributes um, and then you'll get the, the list, uh, get the list. So here it's wrapped in the structure. You can kind of see that this is a, basically what's returned is a list um, a named uh, a named list. So you know the name here is attrib one, just like we set here, and the value is one, just as we set here, et cetera. So you can see the collection of all attributes that have been set for a particular object. Why why would you want to do this? Um, there's more why coming, uh, or maybe I'll mention it now. But I, I think there are kind of two common use cases. Uh, I guess two of the most common use cases, I think, in, in base are you know giving giving things names and then also giving um, giving vectors uh, dimensions. Uh, uh, so you, you basically have a matrix or an, an, an array. Um, let's look first at, at at names. So there there the, the, the Hadley's book uh, basically outlines three ways to name to name uh, or rather to uh, give names. Uh, there's there's a fourth one which I've I've added, I guess kind of maybe for completeness. Um, you know, uh, one one way that you can add names is kind of at the creation of the object itself. So here we've got the, the combined function. So rather than just having elements one, two, three, we can actually make this and we can apply names at the outset. So one, two, three. So we're this this is a this is the name of the element, that's the name of the element, and that's the name of the element. So here we're creating this this object one, which which uh, is is named at the moment of creation. Um, second way to do it is is by assigning 
um, a character vector of names. So let's imagine we have this, this the same the same numerical vector we'll call two, uh, and then we can set the so we can set the names for two. Use the names function and then assign to the names uh, uh, kind of attribute uh, uh, you know a character vector one, two, and and three. And so one will get applied to one. So basically, string one will get applied to numerical one, string two to numerical two, et cetera. Um, I'm actually not sure if there's a there's a recycling rule here. So here I, I've got three elements and three uh, three names and then three elements. So there's a name, a distinct name for each element. I'm not sure if I just if I omitted one element, I'm not sure if there's a if there's a recycling rule. Maybe another bit of homework for me. Um, uh, yes, yes, you need to, to have the same numbers because otherwise you, you don't have names to assign to anything. Yeah, yeah, either it'll be missing a name, it'll be null, or maybe it'll be an error. I'll, I'll, I'll have to try that. Um, um, there's another way that you can set names, and it's with this function um, in, in base R, I guess you can say base R held, it's like the base package, the stats package, set name. So I've, I've provided the namespace here only because of what's going to come next. Um, there's another set names function from a different namespace. Uh, so let's imagine, imagine again, we have the same object, just give it a different name. Um, here, the uh, set names, I'm saying which object, uh, um, for which object I'm gonna set names. And then I, I, I provide in this in M parameter, the, uh, the character vector of, of names. And then here you can see what's, what's been created. So these are the names on top and the elements below. And the last way that you can do this, and this is um, kind of maybe functionally equivalent at some levels, is using uh, Rlang. Uh, so I guess we can catch on a common theme as I, I'm always kind of looking to see what, what Rlang has to offer uh, and where, where it maybe it differs. Uh, it, it is, so here you have Rlang uh, set name. So here it's in the, I guess they call it the snake case instead of camel case. Um, so I just wanted to, you know, provide the namespaces here so it's clear, you know, where it's coming from. This is, you know, base. This is this is Rlang. But the idea is very much the same. Some of the parameters have different, slightly different names. It's X here instead of object, but the idea is, is identical. That we can take this three um, and then uh, then apply um, names names to it. Uh, set the names at, set the names attribute with a a, a vector of character values. Um, the other thing I guess I wanted to bring up, at least it's kind of common in, in, in my own experience, I don't know how much so for, for others, uh, is, is uh, the, uh, there's this package also by Hadley uh, uh, called Haven, uh, which deals with um, kind of ingesting, um, ingesting data files from other, you know, produced by other statistical software packages. Um, uh, and uh, in dealing with, uh, basically it creates also a, a class called the labeled, uh, the labeled class, which uh, allows you um, kind of a bit like with factors, much like with factors actually, um, to have values uh, and then names for those values. So here you can probably see from my taskbar, I'm a, I'm a recovering Stata user. Um, uh, in, 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 in other statistical software packages, Stata, I think also uh, SPSS, uh, SPSS, it's, it's very common, um, a little bit less common, I think, in practice in R, but still, you know, I just wanted to have a little uh, shout out for, for uh, Haven um, as another way that you can set, set names, uh, uh, basically for the values of, of, uh, of vectors in the data frame, or actually values of any vector, it turns out. Um, so that's on names, setting names, which is a kind of common use case in, in, in base in, in R. The second one is with, with dimensions. So here I'll just have a short example. Um, uh, you can kind of have this, this uh, you can create a matrix from uh, a character vector of the values from one to six, and then you can set the dimensions. So the dimensions are, because the matrix kind of have, you know, um, uh, you know, the number of rows and the number of columns. And the result will be basically this matrix, you know, one, one through six that's spread across, uh, spread across two rows and three columns. So one, two, three, four, five, six is the way it gets laid out. So these are two common, common cases, uh, I guess, in kind of base, base R um, for, for attributes. But the biggest Y is coming in the next, in the next section. Um, uh, 
we're going to look at the S3 atomic vectors. So here we're back to the, the family tree of vectors still in the atomic vector branch of the family. Um, and here we're going to meet a few children of the types that we saw previously. So we'd seen basically the whole family tree, atomic, all the different types that exist. And now you're going to see that the children, there are some children of these types, right? Um, uh, we'll look at each one of them in, in, in turn, maybe kind of a little quickly, uh, give, given the time. Um, uh, but, you know, fac uh, uh, factors are uh, kind of a, a child of integers and then doubles kind of, they're, they're, they're basically two, um, two S3 classes that, that are, uh, can be derived from, from, from doubles. Um, maybe at the end I'll come back to this little, little note. Um, so really you can wonder is like, okay, S3, heard it before. If you're like me, you've heard S3 lots of times and never really understood what it, what it meant. Um, so really what, what makes an S3 vector different than their parents? Um, and two answers, um, uh, typically both answers is number one, they have a class uh, and they have attributes. So callback to attributes. Um, you know, attributes that is in addition to the, the class, as we'll see, it turns out uh, that that the class, I think the class is also an attribute. Although here I may wanna do a little research and make sure I'm right in that, that statement. Um, but I, I think it's it's a class insofar as it's something, it's like an attribute that's attribute in the broadest sense that's added to an object. Uh, it's given a class, which hasn't existed up until this point. We've just had vectors of types uh, that are, um, uh, you know, these atomic vectors uh, that have types, but they don't have anything else about them, right? They don't have any other attributes unless we explicitly add them. Now we're coming to S3 atomic vectors that come with a class and typically an attribute. So let's look first at factors. Um, so it turns out factors are, um, uh, factors are, are integer vectors um, that have two additional things about them, the class factor and then some levels. Uh, which is basically a list, a list of all of the, uh, an exhaustive list of all of the levels that that the that the uh, factor could have. So here, let's build a factor. This is going to be kind of the common setup: is build, you know, construct the thing, inspect the thing, and then dissect the thing. Um, so uh, let's build it first. So let's have a factor, this object a factor. Um, you know, it is an integer vector: one, two, three. Uh, and uh, an exhaustive list of values. So here I have one, two, three, and four. Notice that four isn't present in my vector, but I'm saying that it's it's a member of uh, of, of the, the the list of possible values that 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 uh, that this vector could assume, right? Um, and then if I look at just simply look at a vector, you can see that here I have, uh, or sorry, a factor rather, I have the values one, two, and three, and then I have the levels one, two, three, and four. Excuse me. Right. Sure. Excuse me. How can I have four levels if I have just three values? So this is something that I think is particular to factors is that, um, you know, and, and Hadley, so I think like the common point of confusion here uh, is that I, I think in, in base R back when string, when you could create a data, we're gonna come to this, but when you create a data frame uh, and strings are coerced into factors, the factors and the levels are the same. Like you couldn't have a factor level um, that doesn't exist in the data frame. But, um, and how the kind of draws this distinction is that, you know, the, uh, like let, let, let's imagine that these are sort of like outcomes of an experiment. These are possible outcomes in an experiment, um, you know, that we know from theory or from our design is, you know, one, two, three, and four. If we run the experiment, like a particular instance of the experiment, it could be that four isn't observed. Um, uh, and, and so factors are kind of fashioned in such a way that you can have, you can have, um, you can have levels that, that don't exist in the data set. Um, uh, and one kind of convenient thing about this, I'll just kind of go to the, um, anyway, I'll, I'll work in this despite being in a different environment. So if I you know, create my factor and then I do a table a factor, here what's kind of nice is I get counts um, for all of the theoretical levels of the factor. And here I get, you know, it's actually useful that I see that there are no levels of the factor uh, the corresponding for in, 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 my, in my data set. I don't know if that helps, Federico, or if it is Thank you. confusing. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, so if I look, uh, and then I can kind of dissect it, and then I can look and see, you know, what's the type? Um, you know, what's the type of my vector? So we know it's a factor. We made it a factor, but still, I see the type is integer. So you know, remember the family tree uh, that factors are integers in disguise, I guess you can say. Uh, and then if I look at the attributes, uh, I can see that I, I have a, a named list. So uh, the name is levels, um, and then you can see the, the levels and the levels are string values. Uh, and then there's another attribute, which is the class, that it's a factor. Um, I'll, I'll skip ahead out of time consideration, so I'm running a bit long. Um, the, the same uh, kind of fresh, I'll speed through the rest so I can come to the data frames, I guess. But uh, suffice it to say that the other S3 uh, uh, atomic vectors follow the same principle um, that, you know, uh, they are at, at the fundamental level, they are uh, part of, the, they're an atomic vector that has something additional about them, right? So dates are, are double vectors um, with the date class. Now, the additional, you know, you may be scratching your head wondering why is a date uh, a double, uh, and, and it's for this reason that it turns out that the that oops sorry that the um, wow stray click sorry about that um, that the uh, that the date the dates are it's the number of days since January first, nineteen seventy. Um, Uh, so again, you know, I can create, I can create a date, so system date. Um, I can look at its type. It's a double. So what I claimed is true. It's a, it's a, it's an uh, atomic vector that's a, a, a double, uh, but it has some additional things about it. In this case, this class date. Um, similarly, date times. I won't go into the details. It's a little, it's a little complicated. Um, but the same thing is true that you know you can build, you can build a date time. Um, uh, so system time and then time zone, uh, you can look at it, it prints a certain way, it's kind of dissect it and you can see that it's, it's you know, indeed a double because the date times are built, built off of doubles and it has the attributes of, of, of two, two classes. Um, and same with, with durations. So durations are, are um, double vectors, um, class diff time, uh, and then they have the attribute units. Um, so I can construct, um, you know, this this uh, this vector one minute, um, which is a, you know as date time. You know, I have a like a, a vector with one element one, and then I'm saying that the units here it's not seconds, it's not days, it's it's it's, uh, it's minutes. Um, and so then when I inspect it, I can see that you know that the minutes are are displayed. Again, I kind of dissect the, the thing that I've created. I see that it's a, indeed a double and it has a few other things about it. So the class dip time and then, um, uh, then units minutes in this case. Um, just to call out, I guess, to kind of a few similar types of S3 objects. I have not really looked in details, but it's very similar to this. Um, yeah, lists. Uh, Lists are also are commonly called kind of like generic vectors. Uh, so they can be composed of multiple elements. Uh, you know, here I can make a simple list that contains all of the types we've seen up until this point. Uh, if I inspect it, I see that it's a list. And then if I look at the structure, I can see that basically each uh, each um, element uh, of this list is is a is a vector of a particular type. You can have nested lists, uh, you know, lists of lists of lists, etc. Kind of like JSON, um, you can combine lists uh, in different ways. So uh, basically, have one list, a second list, and then wrap it in a list to make it kind of a nested structure. Or use the C command, and you get a very odd outcome here. Um, it sort of um, makes it into a list of individual elements instead of a, uh, a list. Um, right. So you can test that you know list is a list. Uh, in a few ways with these commands to see if it's a list. Uh, uh, also with rlang, you can also uh, check with is list function, see if it's a list of a certain number of elements. Um, right. uh, coming out to the data frame with, I guess, the one minute that, that, that remains, this is maybe the important part. Um, let's come back to the to the family tree. So now we're, we're still within vectors, but we're going to the other major um, branch of the, the family tree, which is lists. 
um, which we've gotten over. And then lists have, uh, uh, you know, have, they're sort of like uh, the S3 equivalent. They're sort of like the S3s of, of, of the list uh, family. Uh, so we have the data frames and, 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 and tibbles. Um, you know, data frames are really nothing more than a, a named list of vectors, you know, where the names are the column names, the class that they have is a data frame, uh, and then they have some attributes, um, you know, the names of, of the columns, uh, the names, uh, which are the names of the columns, and then potentially also, also row names. Um, so if you kind of construct the data frame in this fashion, um, you know, it's a set of atomic vectors, uh, you can see what it looks like. Uh, and then you can also inspect, uh, we can kind of deconstruct it. You look at the type and it turns out that it's a list because again, uh, a data frame is a special type of list. Um, and then you can look at the different attributes, you know, the names, which are the names of the columns, the class data frame, and then the, the row names. So by default, I think these are just the, the, the count numbers, you know, the first, second, third um, uh, uh, rows. Although you could set row names uh, separately. Uh, tibbles are very much like data frames, um, but they're, they differ in two ways. Hadley kind of jokingly and, and, and in short kind of calls them both lazy and surly. Um, so lazy in the following way that tibbles don't do some of the things that data frames do. Um, they don't coerce strings, they don't transform non-syntactic names, and they don't recycle um, in, in inputs where the inputs are greater than one value. Um, so if, if you're composing a data frame in the past, uh, you know, and they consist, you know, here I have a, 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 call, a, a vector of strings. Uh, this, this would result in, uh, trans, you know, coercing, coercing the strings into factors, right? That was the default behavior in the past. I think R 4.1, that changed. Uh, but in the past, uh, it would coerce the, the strings into factors. Tibbles don't do that. Uh, never have done that. So you can kind of look at these two things. Uh, you, can see, you can look at the, these two columns. Um, and, and see the difference. So here in my data frame, um, I, 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 even though I input strings, I end up with factors, tibble, though I, even though I input um, uh, strings, I end up with strings. Um, tibbles don't transform non-syntactic names. So for example, if I have a name that's kind of a not allowed name, one, kind of a problematic name, and I create my data frame like this, I do the same with the tibble, you can see how different the different things treat things differently. Um, data frames will make an additional effort to make a non-syntactic name into a syntactic name. So it's adding an X in front. Tibbles will preserve that name. Uh, and for the not recycling, um, you know, you could have a try to construct the data frame in the following fashion, where I have a vector of four elements and then another, an, another column that's that's a vector of two elements. So you know, data frames need to have the same number, your lists that were, were, were basically the, um, the columns uh, need to have the same length. Um, so they're rectangular. Uh, in, in, in data frames, uh, basically it'll, it'll recycle these values. Tibbles won't do that. Instead, they'll protest, which is, uh, um, you know, I guess makes them both lazy and, and surly, I suppose. So if I try to do this with the tibble, I get an error. Whereas if I try to do this with a data frame, I'll get this, this content will get recycled. So I'll end up with one, two repeating again. Um, surly, uh, tibbles are surly because uh, they don't, when you try to subset them in certain ways, they, they still give you a tibble back. Um, and, and if you try to, um, if you try to kind of subset for a column um, without using its proper name, uh, the tibble will tell you it does, that column doesn't exist. Um, so here, you know, I've got two data frames that I've, uh, so I've got a data frame and a tibble that both have the same contents. Uh, if I try to subset to column one um, with, with, uh, with the data frame, you'll see that what's returned is the vector, right? It's returned as a vector. So I get the vec this column, right? Um, whereas if I do the same with the tibble, same exact syntax, except that this is a tibble, not a data frame, um, not a vanilla data frame. Then, then I actually get a data frame back, right? Um, so the tibble does what it wants rather than maybe what you might want it to do. That makes it surly. Um, there are different ways that you can actually get the column as, as, a, as, as, a, uh, as a vector if you want. 
Um, and then data frame is kind of do something a little bit surprising, which some people use, but maybe it's kind of what Hadley might call off-label usage. Um, is uh, you know here I harken back to my data frame. I see which columns I have. I have column one. Well, let me try to subset and get col col column one by just writing a little bit less. Um, turns out data frames will satisfy my request. The, they'll try to match um, the name and give me something. Uh, tibbles, tibbles say no. Um, tibbles say that, that the, a column will call, col doesn't, doesn't exist. Um, and instead ask that you specify the column with its exact and full name. Uh, right, and you can kind of do testing and coercion just as you could with other stuff. Um, and then lastly, null uh, is kind of a special type of object that, that has length zero and can't have attributes. So that's really all there is to, to null. And now we've covered the full family tree. Um, sorry, I went a bit over time. I don't know if nevertheless there, are, for those who can hang on, if there are any questions or comments, I haven't been monitoring chat. Uh, okay. So thank you very much, Arthur. So is there any of you that would like to present the next chapter? I've seen that someone has signed up for the next chapter. I don't know if you uh, know how to do it. If you all know how to do it, you go on Slack and on the top of the, the page, you find the, the Google sheet and then you can sign up for, for a, a chapter that you would like to present. So we have the next presenter. Uh, but if any of you would like to um, sign up for, for the following week as well. So Trevin will be the next one with subsetting. We have control flow function. Um, so hope you sign up for, for the following chapters. So uh, we go forward with this uh, book. Thank you very much for attending this session. So see you all next week. Yeah. See ya. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.